Hello Year 9 and welcome to today's lesson. Uh, before you begin, please make sure you've downloaded the three attached files, the AMO checklist, the analysis task and the media language task. Obviously, if you want to or if you're able to, you can type directly into those sheets or you could print them off and fill them in. If you can't do that, you'll need to use the prompts on the sheet to help you write your answers in your book. So this is our first lesson on the OMO advert, which is our third CSP. To begin with, a knowledge retrieval task. Featured on this slide are seven people who appear in the NHS represent advert. What I'd like you to do is I would like you to name them. Um, I would like you to identify their specialist field. If you can't name them, what I would like you to do is identify what they do based on their appearance in the NHS advert and the studies that we've had. So this should take you about three minutes. All you need to do is write in the number and the name. Uh, so, for example, number one would be Nicola Adams Boxer. And here are the answers. So number one was Nicola Adams, a boxer. Two was Aid Adepton, a basketball player. Uh, number three, uh, a woman called Kanya King, and she is the CEO of Mobo, Music of Black Origin, who co-sponsored the Represent advert, and she is basically within STEM. Uh, number four, Chukka Amuna, who was a politician at the time. Number five, Aaron Christian, who's an artist. Number six, Maria Idrissi, a model. And number seven, Lady Lachure, who is a grime star and a rapper and latterly dancer on ice, I believe. So this is the final case study that we'll be looking at in our consideration of adverts. And this is uh, an example of a historical media text. This is an advert from over 60 years ago. Now, the important thing to remember about this advert is that we're looking at it both from the point of view of a modern audience, but we're also looking at it from the point of view of the audience in the 1950s. And attitudes then were very different. So this is a very good example of a concept called hegemony, which we've talked about, which is where dominant ideologies change over time. So what we need to accept is that when this ad ad advert was first produced, there wasn't any irony to it. There wasn't any sense there was anything strange in what was being seen. So we need to bear that in mind all the way through this particular study, although we also need to bear in mind that a modern audience will receive this advert in a very different way. So we need to think about what life was like in the 1950s. And we need to think about the uh, influences um, in 1950s society that would create an advert like this. I ought to uh, apologise for the buzz on some of these audio clips, by the way. Sorry about that. Uh, here is the checklist. This is what you need to know. Um, and you can download this. And as with the previous adverts, what you need to do is you need to tick these off as you go at the end, review it. So you can see here that this is very much about the historical context of adverts in the 50s compared to adverts now. We're looking at the denotation and connotation of the advert. We're looking at the design, such as the topography, the layout, codes and conventions of adverts and how they are different to now. And you can compare that to some of the modern examples we've looked at. Uh, the representations in the advert, particularly femininity, uh, stereotypes, which we've talked about a fair bit. And how your interpretation of the advert might differ from the interpretation of the advert that, um, that a contemporary audience, a 1950s audience, might have had. One of the things we think about with regard to media products is positioning and where that media product will be found. This media product has a very specific source. It's from a magazine called Woman's Own, uh, published on the 5th of May, 1955. So this tells us a lot about the target audience, that it was women. Uh, Women's Own is uh, a magazine aimed primarily at a slightly older female audience, uh, predominantly housewives. Um, and um, 
so that tells us a little bit about who the target audience is. Obviously, the, the lady in the advert is representative of that target audience. Um, <clears throat> Omo is a brand. Uh, no longer exists in the UK, although I think it exists in some other countries. Uh, it's owned by a company called Unilever, massive, um, massive um, chemical company, makes a lot of products, uh, cleaning products and cosmetics and things. Uh, in the UK, brands like Surf and Persil have uh, taken over from, uh, from Omo. So we need to think about the context of life in the 1950s for women. So this is about 10 years after the end of World War II, um, and society was trying to find its way back to how it had been before the war, where a lot of women were uh, housewives, were not in employment, and men tended to be the breadwinners. Um, and as we as we might imagine, um, knowing what we know about history, that situation obviously shifts quite radically. But the 1950s was still a point where traditional gender roles were in existence. So very few women were actually in the workplace comparatively. It was expected that the woman would stay at home, look after the family, look after the kids, look after the husband. The man would go to work and provide for the family. And that was the social attitude at the time. That was the social context that the woman's place was in the home. And that wasn't an ironic thing. That was a, an expected thing. And so a lot of media at the time reflect that, uh, what we would regard now as quite a sexist dynamic. So we talked a little bit about essentialism and social constructionalism. And this is a very essentialist idea, that the woman's job is to raise the family and the man's job is to make the money. And this advert very much emphasises that essentialist attitude. So at the most basic level, life for women in the 1950s was a kind of acceptable form of slavery if you if you want to look at it like that um and but really the opportunities just were there and we still see the fallout from that today we still have a society where women get paid less than men now i've obviously given you like a very very short praise of what life was like for women in the 1950s i strongly urge you to do your own research into this as well if you get the chance just watch a couple of adverts um, read a little bit up on what the decade was like, because obviously I can only give you a flavour of it here. I'm now going to ask you to do a deep dive into the advert, uh, looking at its various different media language elements. On the next slide, and as a download as well, you've got a version of this slide without the questions on it. Now, what you will need to do is you will need to answer the questions and you're focusing on the various different elements the call out which is the bit at the top the flash with Omo makes whites bright the heading which is the actual slogan there the graphic the, the image of the woman the body language the para language that she is demonstrating the color scheme the, the yellows greens whites reds and blues the copy and the anchorage at the bottom the topography, the, the typeface that's been used, how that mirrors the product, the slogan. Why has that slogan been used? So I'd like you to go through each of those elements. I'd like to answer those questions. This should take about 15 minutes if you're doing it properly, because you are looking at each of those particular elements in, de in detail. And by now, you should be fairly adept at doing this. Make sure that you think both are what is there what is denoted and what is connoted. So you see an example on the next slide, and then I'd like to have a go at the rest. Uh, I've done the first one for you as a waggle, and this is about the call out. Why is it designed like this? It's been designed to denote a flash, connoting the effect you would get from the brilliant white of the Omo washed clothes. Thinking about that kind of effect where something's so, uh, so clean it sparkles. How does it support the heading? It links to the use of the word makes, because a flash has a kind of imperative quality, like something being forced, something powerful. And it also reflects, in a way, the flash on the front of the Omo box in the pack shot at the bottom left-hand corner, no, right-hand corner. 
the white background reinforces the idea that Omo makes white bright. And white is a dominant, well, it's not really a colour, is it? It's a dominant lack of colour. It's a very pure white. And that connotes the high quality of the product in doing what we expect to do, which is make whites bright. I'd like to spend about 10-15 minutes completing that task and then I will go through some ideas with you as well. Clearly the call out has been designed to reflect a kind of flash um, which you would metaphorically get from the brilliant whites provided by Omo. So it's clearly symbolic of the um, product cleaning properties and it links to the use of the word makes in the uh, in the heading um, because the implication is that the product is so powerful that it forces whites into becoming brighter and the flash we're seeing is the flash of that that force so obviously it's reflexive of the energy and the impact of the OMA. Um, and obviously the idea here is that OMA makes whites bright and here we've got the, the flash, the call out, making the advert bright. And white is the dominant, um, the dominant feature of this advert in terms of the colour scheme. So um, you'll notice also that the box of OMO in the, uh, the bottom um, right hand corner uses a similar idea with the, the flash um, behind the OMO logo. As mentioned, the um, the slogan, in fact, it's interesting because it has three. It's got whiteness alone won't do. OMO makes white bright. OMO adds brightness to whiteness. So um, whiteness alone won't do is quite an interesting one because um, obviously the, the goal with washing is to get your clothes as clean as possible and particularly your whites as white as possible because whites are very hard to get clean and particularly in the 1950s when a lot of washing was done by hand washing they didn't have the kind of washing machine technology we had and the uh, slogan there whiteness alone won't do suggests a kind of um, trying to be better than standard, trying to be um, even more uh, powerful in your washing. Do you think there's a standard that just ordinary white doesn't meet? And, and that's that kind of psychological thing we looked at earlier, that idea that what you're doing isn't quite good enough and OMO will help you to uh, achieve that. <clears throat> OMO makes white bright. Uh, OMO is emphasised here as the solution. Whiteness alone won't do, so OMO makes whites bright. That's what you need to make your whites bright. And you've got the use of um, uh, rhyme there, OMO makes whites bright. As I mentioned, the use of the, the word makes, as if OMO is this forceful power. Um, and there's a weird personification there as well in the idea of the relationship between OMO and the whites. But the whole the whole idea is that the housewife reads this slogan and thinks, oh well, I, I can do better and Omo will help me do better. I will talk about adds brightness to whiteness in a little bit later. There are some fascinating um, connotations of, of how the woman looks. And I just want you to draw attention to a few of them. First of all, I want you to look at uh, the fact that she's done her makeup and um, the idea being that um, that's the expectation of a 1950s housewife that you look good all the time, even when you're doing such um, a drudge task as hanging out the washing. And you've got to remember, as I said to you in one of the previous clips, that um, she'd had to hand wash all this stuff. So this is not a case of whacking it on the washing machine, leaving it for an hour and coming up and hanging it up. Um, and let me, let me tell you, um, hanging up clothes is not a particularly exciting job. She's just spent at least an hour over a very, very hot um, bowl of water doing all this by hand. And then the fact that she's done her makeup and put on her glad rags to do this, uh, you know, it, it's, it's obviously 
trying to represent a, a very idealised view of what life was like for a 1950s housewife. And obviously she's done her hair. I mean, clearly this is the, the fantasy world of an advert, and we know that adverts present a fantasy world. But it's very overt here. Um, the sleeves rolled up obviously represent hard work. They're symbolic of somebody who doesn't mind getting, uh, getting their hands figuratively dirty. Um, I mean, the, the practicality is that she's just in the washing, so she obviously have her sleeves rolled up. Um, the, um, the washing over her shoulder um, has quite an interesting effect because the, um, we'll talk about colours later, but the, uh, the combination of colours and the, the interesting slightly washed out colour. Now this is a, a feature of 1950s photography and it's to do with the uh, film stock they used. And if you ever watch a 1950s film, you'll notice it has a very similar, um, slightly low contrast feel to it. Uh, the, the brightness has been put up slightly high. Um, the expression on her face is, 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 is cause for great hilarity um, because she just looks like she's enjoying this way too much. And it links to the, the copy, particularly the that'll, this'll shake you mother. Now we'll, we'll talk a little bit about who mother is later on, but um, it is obviously the expression of somebody who is very, very entertained by putting the washing out now. Again, clearly, this is a very idealised view of what life was like for a 1950s woman. Um, you'll notice maybe that she is slightly overlaying the uh, the flash, but the slogan overlays her, which implies its importance. Um, so, quite an entertaining little image. The colour scheme in this advert is quite interesting because you've got quite a range of colours there. Uh, white obviously has a lot of colour, but white is symbolic of cleanliness and purity, and that's obviously why it's the dominant colour that's used on a lot of washing powders. And it's also reflective of the colours of most washing powders, because most of them are white. Blue, uh, there's a couple of different shades of blue. Blue has connotations of water. It's also got connotations of a kind of clinical cleanliness, hospitals and things like that. Um, and again, the connotation there is of something which is clean and fresh. We talked a little about that, a bit about that, the connotations of blue in that respect um, earlier in the year. The really interesting colours are the red and the white, because obviously red has connotations of, of danger. Uh, and in this context, I think the red is being used to catch your eye. It's being used in a kind of... Um, almost like to make the washing powder seem to be quite a, an official product um, and to contrast with the with the blue I think just to draw your attention to it uh, and the yellow is really interesting um, I think the yellow is there to just create a contrast um, and to give a sense of of the broader power of Omo because the, the the yellow that she's got and the red on the tea towel that she's hanging up and the green of her um, her top are all very rich and I think the implication there is that the the Omo advert uh, sorry the Omo product not only makes whites bright but it also keeps colors rich and the clear goal of washing clothes is to make sure that they come out the other side looking as good as possible so the implication here the connotation is that Omo not only makes whites bright but it keeps your colors colorful as well and so Perhaps most obviously, these colours are used to draw your eye. Um, now, the copy is quite interesting because you've got two elements working there. You've got the alleged quotation and then you've got the kind of voice of God that appears uh, afterwards. So, the bit in bold starts, this will shake you mother. The, the implication here, now, I think that this is meant to be what the woman in the advert is saying. Now, um, I don't know if she's talking to a literal mother. Mother in the 1950s was a kind of um, a sort of slang term for a, a, a sort of middle-aged woman, um, and it had a sort of sort of hip and fashionable connotation. So, um, the implication here is that this is a woman talking to another woman. Now, if you look at the way the advert is framed, she is looking at us. So we are in role as the woman that she's talking to. Um, it's as if we've surprised her in the garden 
and she's putting out the clothes and she's telling us that and the tone she uses fancy saying or washing powders were the same you can't say that anymore so there's that sort of sense of um, hyperbolic over the top language and it's written like a very bizarre script um, they're bright actually bright now i just want to draw your attention to whites boiled with omo which gives you a little insight into how difficult it was to actually wash clothes boiling them imagine that so the the first bit has that very kind of um overtly hyperbolic over the top quality and then we get the voice of god yes yeah, she's right about omo and this is this kind of voice it's like a masculine voice that comes in to try and uh you know, reinforce the message and look at the language that's used. The wonderful new detergent really does. This exciting, brilliantly bright. And the, the word bright is repeated over and over and over again. And this idea of OMO brightness, that it is a branded brightness. It's the only, you know, you can only get this brightness with, with OMO. Brilliantly bright, clean, white and bright. So, Repetition of the word bright draws your attention to the idea. And the last bit, today, millions of women insist on this extra OMO brightness. So the idea that um, millions of women do it, so you should do it as well. So you've really got that sense of, on the one hand, like a kind of little, um, little uh, personal story about OMO from the, the woman in the advert, and then reinforced by the voice of God from OMO itself, bearing in mind that none of this can be proven. So, in fact, we look at it with a slightly more critical eye, and in fact, we realise the whole thing is just being made up. It's also worth mentioning, actually, that um, <clears throat> this obsession with perfection comes from a, a social context. It comes from this need not only to uh, look after your family, but a sort of expectation of certain standards and that you would maintain those. And if you didn't, then you were doing something wrong. So it's playing on insecurity in that respect, which a lot of adverts do, but perhaps not as overtly as this one does. I ought to mention, actually, um, the amount of copy. It is now unusual to have that amount of text on an advert adverts as I mentioned previously are a lot more visual now but in the 1950s advertising was still quite a young uh, form quite a young discipline and very much linked to um, newspapers and magazine articles and this was located in the magazine so effectively what you've got is an advert which mimics the conventions of magazine articles in terms of the typography, the slogans all use, uh, well, it's interesting because some of it is a sans serif font. The OMO logo itself is sans serif, and it's effectively a kind of impact style font that would have been used also on newspaper billboards. Um, it's designed to draw attention. It's designed to grab your attention. It's the biggest thing on the advert. Um, the uh, makes whites bright in the uh, main slogan almost looks like a kind of hand slightly handwritten font um, which gives it a slightly personal quality as if omo is talking directly to you but then you've got that um, interesting sans serif font that's kind of used in the whiteness loan won't do, which mimics the impact font of the OMO. But then, and the adds brightness to whiteness, which I'll we'll talk about a little bit later, um, that uses a, a kind of serif font. So you would not really get an advert this messy today. I also want to draw your attention to the capitalization of brightness, almost like it's a proper noun. This OMO brightness, it's like they branded it. So um, the copy uses what's effectively a Times New Roman-esque sans uh, serif font, uh, which has that connotation of class and heritage. And it's a little bit easier to read as well for a, a smaller font. And given the size of it, it's quite, it's quite dinky. Um, it, uh, it's a, there's a practical thing there. So um, the OMO logo effectively is trying to mimic the clean... Um, so 
the, clean, the cleanliness of the product, something that is straightforward. It's a straightforward logo, it's in your face. The product is straightforward, it gets your washing clean. That's the message they're trying to communicate there. We've got quite an interesting thing going on with the slogans because there are effectively three slightly different messages. Whiteness alone won't do is is almost a challenge to the housewife. Can you make your whiteness brighter? And then Omo makes whites bright. There's a, um, a, a subliminal call to action there. Go and buy the Omo to make whites bright. And the, the copy <clears throat> reinforces that effectively with its little story and its voice of God. Omo adds brightness to whiteness. Um, you've got that rhyme, brightness, whiteness, we've had whites bright. And remember, bright, the word bright, echoes throughout the advert. So by the end of it, I think it's being used, well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times brighter or brightness. Um, I mean, almost used as many times as the word Omo. So the slogan effectively says that not only will Omo make whites bright, it will add brightness. So uh, like a kind of magic. Um, so it's clearly trying to hard sell. It's trying to tell the woman, the, the housewife, that buying this product will allow you to be a better housewife. It will allow you to achieve the perfection that is expected of you. And of course, as we've discussed, and as hopefully you've seen, the pressure on women in the 1950s, not only to maintain a clean and tidy house, but to do it well, um, and with that being their role, was, was very high. And the idea about the OMO is that it is going to make that burden slightly easier. I mean, that's obviously not absolutely explicit, but it is very much implicit within the advert. Having looked at the advert in general, I'm now going to ask you to concentrate on some specifics. And I want you to basically discuss the denotations and the connotations of the various signs that make up this advert. So I want you to focus on the layout and the design, which focus on the anchorage, the body language, the use of the verbal codes, and anything else which contributes to the meaning of the product. Again, I've done the first one for you. I've talked about the layout and design. I've mentioned that it conforms to the Z rule in that we can transpose our imaginary Z on the on the advert because our eyes are brought, drawn to that yellow box in the top left hand corner. It is the only use of yellow in that way in the advert. It's very bright. And then we scan across the slogan, we scan down the woman, we scan across the copy. Uh, in that case, in that respect, it contains all the things we would expect to see in in terms of advertising uh, in the way we expect to see them. It also conforms to the rule of three in the way that we have the slogan at the top, the woman in the middle, and the copy at the bottom. And we've got the emphasis on the product. We've got the pack shot superimposed over everything. We've got effectively a call to action in the copy, basically saying, use OMO and a lot of persuasive language, a lot of imperative language. Whiteness alone won't do. OMO makes whites bright. What I'd like you to do now is I'd like to spend about 10 minutes jotting down other information you can think about. The anchorage, which is mainly the copy at the bottom, and there's a bigger version of that earlier on in this presentation. The body language, which is very much the woman, her facial expression in particular. Um, the verbal codes, any words or phrases which stand out for you that you think are particularly interesting, and anything else that occurs to you. So this should take you about 10, 15 minutes, no longer. When you're finished, and only when you're finished, move on to the next slide, and you'll understand why I say that when you see the next slide. There's a bit of a teaser for you. 
Right, so what, what, I've, what I've noticed is a tendency for people to just literally copy out everything on the slide. So I'll know that people have done that if I just see this huge block of text. This is not for you to copy out because I didn't expect you to do it like this, but I didn't want you to just copy out all my stuff. So you'll notice I've written these very detailed paragraphs. What I'd like you to do, I'd like you to read through them. I'd like the com you to compare them to your notes and anything that you think you've missed, just bullet point it down. Do not, under any circumstances, copy down these reams of text. Please do not copy down these reams of text. They will not help you. They are simply here to give you an idea of the kind of things you could have talked about. OK. So have a look at these. Compare these to your notes. If there's anything else you want to add, please do so. Pause this slide, read through them, and then when you're done, please photograph everything you've done today. Please upload it. Make sure you've attached it to the assignment. Make sure you've clicked the turning button, and then that is it.